Hello, my name is Dan Harris. I'm the founder and CEO of a charity called Neurodiversity in Business. We've been set up to transform the life chances of neurodivergent employees through supporting and encouraging corporates to make their workplaces more neuroinclusive. This is the latest in the series of podcast series, which is called ND Voices. Um, and I'm really thrilled today to be here with um, a couple of real strong advocates in our field. Um, Emma McNally, who's the CEO of Tourette's Ad, uh, Action, and also Ioni Giogorfkas, and you'll pronounce that better for me in a second, but she's a lead advocate for, for Tourette's Action and also an adult with Tourette's and, and importantly, also an occupational therapist. Um, now, why I was excited to have Tourette's covered in, in this latest of the series is because, unfortunately, Tourette's is uh, underdiagnosed, it's underrepresented in society, even within neurodiversity, it gets a bit of a rough deal in terms of funding, attention and support. Um, and I think it's really important um, to have this as a front and centre across the, the ND uh, discussions. And, you know, speaking to the 500 odd organisational members of NIB, I, I, I say this to you is that let's be inclusive in how we talk and think about neurodiversity rather than excluding certain topics. Um, so, Emma, I only, why, why don't you introduce yourselves first of all? Hi, my name's Emma McNally, as you've said. I'm the CEO of Tourette's Action um, and I've also got a son with Tourette's Syndrome. So that's kind of where I decided to come into the charity and where I come from as my background from it. And I'm Ioni Georgiakis and I am the lead advocate for Tourette's Action. I'm an adult with Tourette's and ADHD and the sort of main aspect of my role is leading awareness sessions for employers and businesses and government organisations all about ticks and Tourette's inclusion, kind of reducing barriers and doing some myth busting. It's a real passion of mine. Great. Well, we're, we're all about myth busting at uh, NIB because um, that, that's our raison d'etre is to, to make uh, neurodiversity um, acceptable in society and talked about. So that's great. Um, so let me ask the, the first question. And Emma, I might direct this at, at you um, leading up the organisation. So yeah. tell me, what's your perspective on neurodiversity and the profile and attention it's getting, particularly in the corporate world, maybe compared to two or five years ago? Well, basically, in society, there's like, I think the figures now is it between 15 and 20 percent of us are believed to be neurodivergent and in the past it wasn't believed to be anywhere near that so we were kind of forgotten and I think the working world it supports neurotypical people so the adjustments are already in place for them by default so we need to now be advocating more to push for the adjustments for people who are neuro neurodiverse um, to get them the adjustments that they need within the corporate world. Yeah, and actually, I love that phrase, Emma, and I'm going to steal it shamelessly, if I may, but the the adjustments are already in place by default for neuro neurotypical people. And I think that's really important because what we say within NIB as well is that get this right for your neurodivergent staff and you get this right across the, the spectrum, right, for the, yeah. the whole of your workforce, yeah. Um, OK, well, look, I'm, I'm going to throw it to Ione because you're an adult with Tourette's and you can t you can just kind of myth bust for us for a few minutes. You know, tell us what this is. You know, how does it present? How variable is it? And then importantly, you know, how should we in society um, support? Um, and also, how does the corporate world need to do more? What a good selection of questions. I'm going to break <laughs> it down and, and look at them one at a time. But so essentially Tourette's is a, is a neurodevelopmental, neurological condition that typically starts in childhood. The key features are tics, which are involuntary sounds and movements. And we often see these symptoms sort of start to emerge at around five or six. They peak in adolescence and get worse, which is expected with many, many difficulties and many cases reduce into adulthood. However, what we know is that adults who experience symptoms of Tourette's throughout the course of their life might 
uh, have more treatment resistant or chronic symptoms and therefore they might need a little bit more support to access the workspace safely and effectively and to really harness and honest, honour their skills because they certainly have lots of them. The prevalence across society is estimated to impact 300,000 people in the UK. So the first myth that I love to bust is that this condition is not rare. Mm. It, it has a similar prevalence mm. to autism. It, the international prevalence is the same as well. It's not just a, a condition that impacts in Western countries. Um, and actually some recent research out of the US suggests it could be as common as sort of one in 50 young people have this condition. So we need to be discussing it and addressing it mm. a lot more than we are. The second difficulty with Tourette's is that it remains an incredibly stigmatised condition and people, whether they mean to or not, make 101 assumptions about the condition and about the type of employee that they may be bringing onto their team if they have this condition, this diagnosis. And what we know is that the misunderstanding around Tourette's being the swearing condition is uh, really unrepresentative. So uh, coprolalia, which is the utterance of socially unacceptable words or swear words, impacts around 10 to 15 percent of the Tourette's community. However, it makes up for nearly 100 percent of what we see on our TV screens and in the media. And this can mm. uh, really sort of skew how people perceive the condition it's really important that we give voice to those symptoms and experiences because they are very real for many, many people and they have a profound impact on people's ability to access work and socialisation safely. But it also is important that we represent all different experiences of this condition. Um, I think for me personally, as both a professional and as an adult with Tourette's, the most important thing that we can be doing as employers and organisations is creating social adjustments, creating a social environment where people feel safe to tick freely, loudly and proudly, where people do not have to mask their symptoms or their difficulties for fear of sort of repercussions or distracting others. So I'm slightly biased because it is my role, but I think what we need to be doing is addressing sort of training and awareness on an organisational level. So if your colleagues understand your needs and your condition, from entry level positions right up to management, you're going to feel safer and more able to advocate for yourself. They're going to understand some of the subtle complexities of the condition and some of the difficulties that we don't see, like pain and fatigue and executive dysfunction. Um, and it's really hard to accommodate for the side of the, the condition that we don't uh, that we don't see. Got it. And if I may, then, because this is this has been really informative, another thing that I would like us to jointly bust the myth on is um, correlation with intelligence, right? So tell us about what does the scientific evidence say there? Great question, absolutely. I mean, Tourette's is not a learning disability, has no impact on IQ. In fact, what we know is that many people eh, who have Tourette's uh, are incredibly sort of creative, innovative thinkers. We have people across the spectrum who are, you know, who are managers, who are doctors, who are healthcare professionals, who are teachers. Um, it's, it's not something that means that someone has an intellectual disability in any way. But what it does mean is that they might need a few extra adjustments or support to help thrive in areas that they struggle. And alongside that, they're going to bring you really unique strengths and assets to a team that maybe aren't as seen in, in neurotypical populations. 100%. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and then just just tell me, then let's put ourselves firmly into the, the corporate space then. So um, what are the tangible things that corporates can be doing? And I know one of the obvious things is that culture change, which I think the three of us are doing here right now, which is talking about it, making society where it exists and that it's acceptable and it's normal. Um, but what what are the things that can be done by businesses to make sure that they're tapping into that talent pool um, in terms of recruitment, um, but then also um, the, the, the population who are already employed by them, how should they be supporting them? Great question. So yeah. I think it's becoming increasingly popular to advertise yourself as a sort of neurodiverse, inclusive employer. But I think it's really important that you're actually putting the systems and infrastructure in place to honour that title. 
and looking at how you can be inclusive really from recruitment and advertisement stage right through to supporting someone before they're in post. Don't allow people to come into post and to struggle without the support in place. We tend to have quite a lot of warning when people are joining our team. Um, one way that we can make our recruitment more accessible is to offer you know online and face-to-face -face sessions we can give people questions beforehand i've spoken to many employers and recruiters who say oh it gives us really unauthentic answers but actually for many people with executive dysfunction difficulties or communication difficulties that can be the difference between seeing them at their absolute best or their absolute worst right, and right. when they go into their work role they know their work role so they're not going to be surprised mm. so actually we're creating an accurate way to assess this person's strengths and skills um, I think it's important to have some adaptability and flexibility within the roles. So we're always taking a strengths based approach to our employees. We're looking at where people shine. It's something that Tourette's action do wonderfully well with me. I'm not not wonderful admin, but I love public speaking. And so my role has been adjusted to really honour the areas of strength that I can bring to the team. Um, and it's something that I think we can all be doing a lot more of. And if COVID taught us anything, it's that we can be more flexible in our approach to work. We can do remote working. We can kind of adjust those systems. So let's continue to do that in a sort of proactive and non-reactive way so we can create a sort of culture of inclusion for everyone. Great, great. I think we need to completely encourage flexibility with all employees be completely flexible and work to the employee's strengths. Like that's what I think we do really well at Tourette's Action. Um, and one thing that I'm really passionate about is that we, we need to educate the corporate world so they actually really understand what Tourette's is because there's huge misconceptions around it. People don't actually understand what it is. And I think that in itself creates the barriers for employees because they've got these Everyone has heard of the word Tourette's, but they don't understand what that actually means. And these misconceptions then create barriers before you've even got an interview or before you've even gone through the door. So I think educating on it first and foremost is really important. Great. Well, Emma, I, I think as I thought I would do, I learned a lot from you today. And I hope that also our corporate members and our community partners have as well. And, you know, just keep up that good fight of raising awareness and um, keeping this front and centre. I'm really delighted to have you as um, a community partner with Neurodiversity in Business. Um, and also you're, you're going to be at the, uh, the, the conference on the 16th of March. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And um, speaking now to the corporate members, please do pay attention to this topic. Please do remember that neurodiversity itself needs to be inclusive. It needs to encompass all elements of neurodiversity, not just the most high profile ones or the topics which get the most attention. Um, and jointly, that's the way we can build in inclusivity by design. So thank you for listening to this, uh, the latest in the series of podcasts, ND Voices, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.